Welcome, everyone, to the REST podcast, where our goal is to help each and every one of you displace confusion, chaos, and dis-ease in order to heal and find significance in life. I am your host, Natalie Williams, and I am here with our COO again, Mr. Stephen Prophet, and the author of The Reconstitution Method for Healing and Rest, Virginia Dixon. We're jumping back into our discussion from last week, but we'll be following what Virginia calls the anatomy of dissent. Virginia, I know you feel that we didn't quite hit the nail on the head last week. What have you realized about the lies we tell that is of utmost importance to share with our listeners and wasn't in the previous episode? Thank you, Natalie. I'm glad we have the opportunity to circle back and discuss this. First of all, Stephen, thank you for being here, and we love having you here. We're thankful that you're here, and I'm really happy that everyone got to hear from Stephen a little bit. I think what Stephen said last week about the specific lies associated and attached to academic performance were a real source of bondage, and it was his pilgrimage to rest, right, Stephen, was negotiating some of... Yeah, that was a major thread for me. Yes, yeah, some Absolutely. of the confusion and chaos that comes with that. So I think we kind of got caught up in one specific lie. And I want everybody to get to know Stephen, of course, but I think we landed there a little bit, perhaps too long. And I want everyone to have access to the lies we tell ourselves, sometimes the lies that we've inherited from our parents and our ancestors, and sometimes the lies that we believe from these well-intending relationships that we have in friendship and sometimes with institutions and things like that. Mm -hmm. It can all become very, very confusing. But since we're discussing what are the barriers to healing, I do think that the lies that we believe about ourselves, the lies we tell ourselves, the lies we absorb, right? The lies we inherit are certainly barriers, but I want people to be able to identify the source of those lies. And they generally come in three basic ways. It'll come from the I want, I need, and the I deserve. Mm -hmm. Rooted in the lust of the eyes, in Stephen's case, he was very gifted So he saw that this is a place where he could excel Mm -hmm. and these degrees, right, Stephen, could fulfill something. It was the, I want, I can access that. That's easy for me. And I need, and I I liked how he explained it. I need it because it built a sense of community. We've experienced, or we know people who've experienced broken homes, right? A lot of us, we see the condition, the family and the state of the family is in. And so the, I need, I need community. I need to fit. I need to know I can contribute. And so what? Stephen's really bright. So he went and that was a natural fit. And then I deserve this. I've worked really hard and I've given, I give so much towards this. I invest so much in this, but all of a sudden our whole sense of identity is in that realm. And of course, Stephen navigated through that and it really became a fruitful journey. Not, a, not an easy one, huh? but a fain, painful journey out of the bondage of those lies because you're so much more than a brain. And I think you did a good job explaining that to us last week. I think for today, Natalie, I think it's important for people to understand how those lies ensnare us. And I hope those three things, the I want, I need, I deserve, I hope people can process that. And I know we talk a lot about that in our previous podcasts that we've released, but I think the lies are the starting point in the anatomy of our descent. And they're usually driven by the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, right? Those things we see, those things that we crave, right? And then those things that, doggone it, I'm going to make that happen no matter what. And those things can, those lies can enslave us. So do you think, did I leave anything out? Because today we're going to start talking about fear and shame, I think a big thing too, and and we've talked about this when it comes to self-deception, like lying to ourselves, the impact that that has on our own bodies, Yes, like not just our choices, but also our own bodies. Lies are literally poison. So, I mean, even if you lie to somebody else, there was actually something that you can go and look up on YouTube and it was either a school or a scientific study. But what they did was, is that they decided to figure out 
the frequencies of specific words, positive and negative. Oh, yeah, the hidden messages in water. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. And what they did was is that they would s- put a water droplet underneath a microscope. They would speak a word, positive or negative, and then they'd freeze it with liquid nitrogen in order to see the crystalline structure. Hmm. And it's all on YouTube, so you can go see it. Yeah, and it's it became a whole international thing. But I, I think that is important because lies have a frequency, truth has a frequency. Yes. Hmm. And the word hell has a frequency. The word heaven has a frequency. Um, the word pornography has a frequency. The word love has a frequency. Hate has a frequency. But it is fascinating to see the molecular structure and the constitution of the water as these words not only are spoken, but like you said, when they're taped or just, it's fascinating. Mm. Yeah. So words, ideas have consequences though, right? Words have consequences. Yeah. So the merit of truth or not in any given situation becomes really important because as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. And we see the consequence of these ideas, right? And of course, working at the clinic, as long as I did, I saw the manifestation of that physically. And we're going to talk about that at length in future podcasts. Yeah. But for today, the concept of these lies is the starting point to our descent. So we need to become skilled at identifying what those lies are. I I want to invite also our listening audience to submit questions Mm -hmm. and things that they would like us to expound or elaborate on around this topic, because this is really complex. Yeah. And I don't want to oversimplify it, but it is a starting point of how we dissent, right? So be careful for the, I want, I need, I deserve, and then say, wait a second, Is there a lie associated with that? Anyway, the reason that's a starting point is because it leads to confusion. Stephen, do you want to add anything to what I just said about lies? Yeah, I was reading a little bit earlier today from an author named John Mark Comer, who wrote a book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And one of his quotes I'm sitting with as we're having this conversation, he writes, what you give your attention to is the person you've become. Put another way, The mind is the portal to the soul, and what you fill your mind with will shape the trajectory of your character. In the end, your life is no more than the sum of what you gave your attention to. That's right. And I think- The stories we tell ourselves, right? There's a lot of truth to that. Obviously, a ton of nuance we could add to that. But when it comes to lies having a frequency, truth having a frequency, what are we giving our attention to? Mm -hmm. And so I think this first step in self-awareness is to ask ourselves that question is, what am I giving my thought energy to? What am I giving my emotional energy to when I don't have to be thinking about anything else or doing anything else? Where does my mind go? Mm -hmm. And so just developing that awareness of where my attention is being oriented. Mm -hmm. And And for you to make it very practical, because you spoke about this at length. Yeah. And to you, it was in something that you were gifted in. It's something that you refine, something you pr- you protected, something you find identity, community, and success in. But the lie is that that is who you are. That yes. is the sum total of you. No, it is not. And I've gotten to know you very well. And it's your humility. It's your tender heart. It's your desire to strive to be whole, and to bring wholeness to people. By the way, that's ultimately why we ended up bringing you on board, because rest is about speaking to the whole person and yes. bringing healing to the whole person Yes, in their spheres of influence, in their relationships, first and foremost, in their thought life, in their spheres of influence, yeah. in their relationships, in their marriage, in their family, in their parenting, in their community, and hopefully in their state and hopefully nationally. And that's our goal. Our goal is to bring wholeness, right, to people. Yes. But I love your pilgrimage, the pilgrimage that you committed to as a human being. And it was so compelling to me. So I can't wait for people again to get to know you because I think you have a lot to say about that. Yeah. But it does start with facing the lies we tell about ourselves and the lie in your situation was the limiting beliefs that this is the whole of who you are. Because when you accomplished all those things, it still wasn't enough, huh? Yeah. Not only would I, was I still empty, I was disappointed that this thing that I thought would fulfill me didn't. 
That's right. And one of the lenses that's really helped me understand this, there's a a professor at Duke Divinity School where I did my master's work named Dr. Warren Kinghorn. He's a professor of psychiatry there. And he says, I'm paraphrasing, that people will always do our best to get what we believe we need in a given situation. Again, uncovering the truth. Uncovering. So the question then becomes, what do I believe I need and why do I believe I need that? And why am I going about trying to get it in these Those particular ways. Way. So if it's, if I'm idolizing a relationship, if I believe that having this person's attention, affection is going to bring me fulfillment and satisfaction. And so then I'm performing in the relationship through my caregiving. I talked about that last week, performing through caregiving in order to earn this person's mm-hmm. attention, because I believe that having this person's attention and affection is going to satisfy me, fulfill me, meet the depth of my emotional mm-hmm. needs. Then Self-awareness is really important because this is a story that I'm telling myself. And inevitably what happens, we we put tremendous pressure on that relationship to bear the mm-hmm. full weight of our emotional needs. We crush it with expectation, end up causing conflict, tension, et cetera. And so and everything you know, becomes more complicated. And everything becomes and, more complicated. And by the way, I'm glad Stephen brought this up. That's why we start with how we love, mm-hmm. understanding the hungers that drive you in order to bring everything to bear on, hey, what am I, what's my purpose in life? What am I doing here? And that, what Stephen just said, is exactly why we focus so much in helping people understand attachment, the hungers that drives them, drive them, and help uncover their purpose. Yeah. yeah, it really helps to give people a bird's eye view because most of the time we are way too close to our own trees to see the forest. Yes. So right. yeah, it really gives us a bird's mm-hmm. eye view. And something else that I wanted to add really quick was the reason why I mentioned the water study mm. was because I know that a lot of people struggle with thinking that things like lies, things like specific words, like when mm. you curse somebody, when you say like, oh, I hate you no, or yeah. things like that. It, it affects them on a molecular level. People struggle in realizing mm. that. And the reason why I bring up the water study is because everyone knows it is common knowledge. Our bodies are majority of water. Yeah. Well, that's why. And I reference this book because it speaks to the human condition like no other book I've ever right. read. But that's why when the Bible says in the tongue, right, is the power of life and death. Yes. So I want everybody, if nothing else, think about the I want, I need, I deserve, and understand the impact and the significance of the words you use to speak to yourself. And yes. I love, Stephen, how you address that and the points you brought up are excellent. I want to get to how we dissent quickly, yes. because I know we try to keep these podcasts you know, within a reasonable time, but the lies is the starting point. If something doesn't feel right intuitively, if there's a check in your conscience, ask yourself, yourself, wait a minute, what are the lies I am telling myself or what are the lies I'm believing? Yeah. The reason that's imperative is because if you don't intercept the dissent, Mm -hmm. and I loved how Stephen explained the layers, how it gets into layers and layers of complexity, because if you don't intercept it at the origin of the lies, confusion sets in. And the next stage, the next decline from confusion is this word that I know people don't like, but it's very effective. It's very simple. And I think we need to introduce in our vocabulary, and it's a word called sin. Mm -hmm. Sin is when we violate our own conscience. The natural law of God is written in the heart of every man. The conscience bears witness. There isn't a single human being that I've ever counseled or a child that I've ever worked with that did not have a conscience. Mm -hmm. Yes, they do. And what they don't understand is that that's their most sacred property. And the treasure, the thing that they need to protect most and cultivate and nurture and grow is the sensitivity of that conscience and the emotional intelligence of that conscience. Why? Because when we violate our conscience, it is the greatest assault and is the greatest violence we'll ever commit against ourselves. I see that every day. I've monitored that. I've graphed that. And as you know, Natalie, I've picked that up through all kinds of energy work. And from a violation of conscience, then the decline continues in that we cover, we hide, and we blame. Mm. And that is the anatomy of our descent. And since today... We're talking about shame and fear. 
I want to help people understand how both come into play. Okay? Yeah. When we violate our conscience, I call that the line of despair. Mm. When a person violates their conscience, whether they're aware of it or not, that is where the seeds of despair set in. But because we swiftly tend to cover and hide and blame, and by the way, many times these things happen at an unconscious and subconscious level. Yeah, We're not aware of what's happening to us. It's not till people come into my office and the number one feeling that I have to help them understand is fear. And the reason that impacted me so deeply is because years ago I was dealing with a very complex situation. And I went to that source that, in my opinion, speaks to the human condition. And it was so amazing how I had this amazing conversation, honestly, through my studies with God. And it was all congruent with laws of nature, things that are self-evident and appealed to my natural affections. And then, Natalie, you know, I go to philosophy, theology, and I go to all the science, and that plumb line's got to fit, right, for me to say, okay, this is truth, going back to the subject of truth. This is truth. And I'll tell you something. I have not, in 20-some years, found an exception to this. When people do not combat and defeat the lies— it sends them into a tailspin of confusion that puts them in a place that usually leads them in that state of confusion, right? We're anxious in a state of confusion. And then we start drawing on our own resources. We silence the highest conviction of our conscience. And what do we do? Whatever we want. And we violate our conscience often. And we know because immediately we cover, we hide, and then we begin to blame. And it's usually ourselves. Why did you do that? You shouldn't have done that. Yeah. Or that person is doing this to me and we accuse ourselves or others. Yeah. It's just the I mean, bottom line. In the simplest forms, it's literally like a kid going to steal a cookie from a cookie jar. The original lie is, oh, I need a cookie I haven't eaten in however long. And then oh, minutes. but and I, I want the cookie because it tastes so good. You know what? I deserve the cookie. Like I I've been I've been a good boy today. And then they go and they take the cookie and what do they immediately do? They find a place to hide to eat the cookie. And then when mom asks, Why are the crumbs all over the counter? Why are the crumbs going into the bedroom? What's on your hands? They go, Oh, my brother took the cookie and he gave or, me a I piece. Don't know, just or, the lies. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And they tell lies, but again, like they hide, they cover, and then they blame. Mm-hmm. They even blaming a dog. <laughs> it happens all the time. Yeah. Simplest form right there. It is. It's self evident. You see these things in children. So I was, Stephen, I was telling Natalie that when I was in calculus and I was in these other courses and statistics in college and having to write computer programs for the research that I was designing and whatnot, oftentimes I felt like I was going to just have a stinking nervous breakdown. Mm. And to work my way through that and not lose my mind, I had to go back to basics. Okay, wait a minute. I know two plus two is four and four plus four is eight. So I'd find basic patterns and things where I could reason sequentially yeah. To push through the barriers that were holding me back. And I think that's what I'm inviting people to do. Back to very basic things. Why am I always talking trash on my mom and dad? Where am I hiding? Yeah. Why am I hiding here? When did I start hiding here? What made me? What, when, where, why, how? Yeah. Of hiding, right? And then, wait a minute, what did I start covering up? When did I start covering that up? Why did I start covering it? How? And you know what? At the end of the day, wait, instead of talking about my mom, my dad, my boyfriend, my husband, my child, wait a minute. When did I really violate my conscience pertaining to this one thing? And then when did I become really confused? What confused me? What was happening in my life? Mm -hmm. And what are the lies I began to believe? Maybe that my husband's a workaholic. He's never there. I'm on my own. Really? He works really hard. He comes home. Maybe he's not perfect, but he shows up every night, right? Mm -hmm. So what are the lies we really start believing about our husbands, our children, our spouses, our relationships? And I just want to invite people that without seeing a therapist, there's a real tangible way that we can deal with the confusion, chaos, and dis-ease in our lives Mm -hmm. and the, the things that we know are barriers to our own healing. 
So I'd like to do a little segment, I think, on this and post it this next week on the whiteboard so I can illustrate this for people. Okay. If we could do that. Yeah, on, I'll do a little Instagram. Instagram. And Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. Because I want people to have a visual of this because it's so easy. I think that'd be great. To track. So the, in, the line of despair... And I think the critical point where we still have room to intercept the decline is when we can identify, of course, the lies, because it can hedge off confusion. And when we can see where did we really violate our conscience, if we can stop there, we will not go to cover, hide, and blame. But if we do not, and the decline continues, we do, we cover, hide, and blame. And the number one feeling you will always be dealing with It's not anger, it's not unforgiveness, it's not hate, it's fear. So I want our listening audience to really ponder and process that. Because we know that the historic decline and the descent that we get from history comes with the three lies, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, right? The pride of life, I want, I need, I deserve. And what? They became confused and sinned, and they covered, they hid, and they blamed. Then we know that this creator God. And by the way, every single one of us experiences, where are you? Where are you hiding? What did you do? You know, where are you? Where did you go? What did you do? But I think it was just that, where are you? That's it. Mm -hmm. But we know that Adam said, I'm hiding. We're hiding. I'm, we're afraid. I don't forgot if it's the I or the we, but the point is that when we cover, we hide and we blame the feeling behind that and I've never found an exception to this, is fear. So how do you walk with people through that fear? How do you walk with them into healing? That's a great question Stephen just asked. Because I know there's people right now that think they're angry, and they're bitter, but they're really afraid. Yeah. And they're afraid because they haven't reconciled the conflict within themselves. First of all, I listen very carefully with my ears. I hear the nuance of every single thing they're telling me. And then I listen with my heart because those are very different processes. And when I'm working with people, I'm always praying. And I try to silence my convictions and my knowledge. I silence myself and I just look at them like this beautiful canvas and this beautiful thing that I know that is going to emerge from our the season that we work together. Mm. So what I want to know is if they're blaming, everybody comes in blaming themselves or others, mm. always. Mm-hmm. Then I have to discern where they're hide- where the hiding began. Yeah. What, when, where, why, and how. And then I have to f- figure out what they're covering up, when, where, why, how, and what, and then when they violated their conscience. This is a beautiful, easy template to help people come from that line of despair. Because that line of despair that happens when they violate their conscience, I call that shame. And it is generally shame and guilt, compounded guilt that turns into shame. And I say compounded guilt because guilt is wrongness of doing. Mm-hmm. Shame is wrongness of being. Yeah. Those are two different things. Yeah. And that line of despair is what keeps people down. So to answer your question more directly, Stephen, is I just work them back up from that dis- decline. It doesn't happen in one meeting. Sometimes it happens very quickly, but it doesn't happen in that meeting. It usually happens over time. But what I do begin to teach people is how to reason government. I call it reasoning governmentally. I do try to teach them how to reason because my goal is always to empower them to work through these things themselves. So as I teach those resources and those tools, they can go and communicate them to their spouse, their children and everything. And then it becomes like a brush fire of healing. Yeah. So, yeah, but to answer the question just very simply is I need to figure out what, when, where, how, why they're hiding. It's more complicated than that, but that's my grid. I'm also thinking about the relationship between fear and shame because, I mean, we know from our experience, we know from psychology research that shame is a distinct emotion. As I've sat with that in my own life and in my work with people in counseling that I've done, I would describe shame as the fear that I'm unlovable because this thing has happened to me or because I've done this thing. Yeah. It's a violation of conscience. You're aware of it. 
yeah, you're aware of it, but the feeling is that I need to cover, I need to hide, I need to blame because this thing makes me unlovable. By the way, compounding the lies. Yeah. And here's where lies compound, right? Yeah. Because we're all, to some extent, unlovable. We're all broken. We all mess up, right? We perfect. all hurt each other. We all let each other down. Yeah. So we kind of have to see our common humanity in that. But I think as we confess our conflicts, our sin, our conflicts with one another, it humanizes all of us and we can learn how to love because we can we realize, oh, heck, we all need grace, which is unmerited favor, right? And we all need to learn to extend each other mercy, overlook an offense. Yeah. And it's until we become transparent with these feelings of feeling unlovable, and we can help bring those into conversation, yeah. that we can break all the barriers. Yeah, I'm telling you, this conversation right here, this is how I help people heal so quickly. Yeah. This is it. Yeah. You literally work backwards. And you even, mm-hmm. this is something that you actually discovered when you were like, seven years old because you were getting so you you've told the story before in past podcasts where you said you were getting so confused as to why there was so much hate everywhere and the first thought 60s that came, new york yeah and the yeah. first thought that came to your mind was someone's lying that was the first thing that came to your mind and that's the very first thing that is at this anatomy of yes, the scent. that's right yeah. somebody's lying to us mm-hmm. i don't hate them they don't hate me we don't even know each other but i saw the pain because that's when the social, the political whole agenda of progressive, whatever started taking place, you began to see where there was a divide. Yeah, it was the racial conflict in the 60s. It was crazy what was happening. But right, as a child. And, and that's another thing. Be careful. Listen to your children. Listen to each other. Because it's amazing. God has this intimate, beautiful, private conversation with us, I think. At very, very young ages, we just don't understand how to listen. We know how to hear. We don't know how to listen well. Mm -hmm. And so we miss all these treasures and callings and everything in the hearts of our children, our friends, our spouses, our colleagues. And there's treasures in there to be found about freedom. Yeah. And and the calling people God has on people's lives. So for me it came out of a lot of pain, right? Mm -hmm. Being an immigrant and coming to America and seeing Exactly what you said. Somebody's lying here. That is the real seed I have, how I began, how really God began to romance my heart into understanding what would become the reconstitution approach to healing. But Stephen, you know, when there's broken homes and we have the pain of leaving our country and being an immigrant and all that, there is a lot of potential shame in all of that. But for some reason, I always had the capacity to speak about feeling unlovable. You know, you leave your country, then your parents get a divorce, then you're in this confusion, chaos, and dis-ease, and and the the whole racial tension. And then mom leaves, and there's so much pain, nothing but pain. And so you do feel vulnerable. You feel unlovable. You feel like, what's going to happen next? Mm -hmm. But for some reason, I had a father, and I had a home where these things could be discussed. And I found peace, and I found growth, because I was able... I didn't have to cover and hide and blame. We intercepted it there. So the shame never really set. This is nothing I could have read in a book. This is nothing I could have come up with. It was just a pilgrimage of so many years. And ultimately, and I think I mentioned it before, I was tormented and working with a particular patient 15 years ago. And I'll never, ever forget 2.33 in the morning, God just saying, Virginia, you're worried about so much. Let me show you the anatomy of dissent. And it was this template, and I've never found an exception to it. So I think I want to give people hope. If you're dealing with fear or shame, there's a way out. And you don't have to go to years of therapy. You have to understand, wow, how do we dissent the lies we tell ourselves and the lies we believe or the lies we've inherited, there's a number of ways lies come to us, we become confused. And it's that confusion that causes us to violate our conscience. And this is where the line of despair comes in. We immediately cover, hide, and blame. And I want to challenge everyone to think about their perspective on a job, on the course they took in life, or 
I think it's easier to find relationships because the way we begin to define many relationships is by the things that hurt us or ways in which we've hurt people. But either way, there's blame, either internal or external. So usually we can all land on that little word that I'm going to illustrate through Instagram on blame and then go back to what am I hiding, where, when, and why, and then work upwards. It's an easy place to land. This is so good. I'm so excited that we are sharing this with everyone because I know that this is, and I mean, even Aaron talked about it in our anger, Asperger's, and healing episode. Right. Mm. He talked about that this was the most important piece of information that he got that he continually uses in life. And he's held on to this. And and I know that I have too after working with you. This has been one of the biggest realizations that I even had. It's a good go-to, isn't it? Absolutely. There's an executive from Pepsi that I worked with for a number of years. And I'll never forget him calling me from the East Coast. He traveled all over the world. But he's in the East Coast. And he said, Virginia, you're not going to believe it. We were in this intense meeting. It was a two, three-day thing. And it was like, nobody's leaving till we resolve this. And all it was, it was bitter. It became contentious, these top executives, right? And then he said, wait a minute. We have dissented to like, we are in the pit. And everybody in this room right now is blaming. So he said, I just opened up my hand and under the table, <laughs> I did a zigzag. I did your anatomy of dissent and I started with lies. And then I went to confusion and he said, okay, wait a minute. This is a perfect time to apply what Virginia has been teaching me. Do you know what he said? I went to the top guy who had authority and then the second guy who had power. Mm. And the rest of us had power and authority in our respective fields that we had to report on. But the two head head guys that ultimately we all answer to, it was the two of them. <laughs> and do you know what? He said, this helped me in two questions. Boom. It ended, and everything was resolved. And they all turned and looked at him and said, what was that? That was amazing. They didn't know what had happened, but he pierced the darkness of confusion, chaos, and dis-ease because he was able to identify everybody's blaming, mm -hmm. who's covering, hiding, blaming, who's covering, who's hiding, who's violating their conscience, and where the confusion began, and what are the lies. So he went to the two top guys and respectfully asked a few questions, and that was it. Wow. He said, this stuff really works. You're not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, Stephen, closing thoughts. I know you're just coming on board and stuff, but I just... Well, one thing I'm just sitting with is how brave it is even to admit that we're afraid. I think we're socialized to not give space for emotions that are uncomfortable or messy. And I think it takes a lot of courage just to say, I feel scared. I feel afraid. And I think self-awareness takes a lot of bravery to develop because it means sitting with emotions that are hard to untangle sometimes mm -hmm. that have a lot of different roots and layers. And for yeah. all our listeners out there, first, just want to affirm like how brave it is even to say, I feel ashamed. I feel afraid because that is the starting point of healing. And I think this lens that Virginia is bringing to it, the anatomy of descent is a roadmap for helping to uncover the stories that we're telling ourselves about ourselves and about our experiences that are giving rise to the fear and the shame that we're feeling. And there's power in that. There's power in naming those stories because then we can begin to unpack them, to recognize that we're giving power to these narratives that we don't have to give power to in our lives. And that's a starting point for healing and freedom and deeper wholeness that can transform our lives. Yes. That's wonderful. And I would add one thing. What Stephen said is spot on. And the only thing I would add is it takes a lot of courage to stop blaming yourself and others and to approach things with a hunger and a desire for rest. Yeah. Reconcile the confusion, chaos, and dis-ease and seek clarity, order, and ease. We do not have to begin with blame. Right. So with that, I'll bid you all farewell, and I have an appointment waiting. Yes. <laughs> but thank you. Thanks, Stephen. That was a great close. Yeah. That thank was. you all for a great conversation.
Of course. Thank you. All right, everyone. Don't forget our upcoming afternoon of rest is this Saturday, September 25th. So that's literally going to be tomorrow. (laughs) It's going to be an incredible four hours at a beautiful retreat location. And there are only a few spots left. You can still register and come if you'd like. So you can find the details and register under the events tab on our website, virginiadixon.com. For updates about rest and this podcast, please visit our Instagram or Facebook, The Place of Rest. If you'd like more information about Virginia or to support and join the cause of rest, please go to virginiadixon.com forward slash collaborate. Thank you for listening to Rest with Virginia Dixon. Have a wonderful weekend. Mm -hmm.